Hello and welcome to episode 16 of the Teacher's Tea Time podcast. My name is Mark and I hope that you're doing well. This podcast is about, by and for anyone who has ever had anything to do with schools and education. That's probably almost everybody. Topics and content in this podcast are listener generated. They come from listeners just like yourself. We are proud to be a member of Adjacent, a design collaborative made up of educators who dream of a better world for our students and their teachers. Learn more at adjacent.org. I have a mug of tea ready, so let's sit back, relax, and get on with the show. In this episode, we continue our conversation with Doug Wren. Today he tells us why we have standards and standardised assessment, and we get into some of the problems with standards-based teaching, learning, and testing. So without further ado, here's our conversation about standards and standardised assessment. You know stuff about assessment way more than I do. Um, and so I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you. And these come out of things that happen to me when I'm teaching some of my classes. Mm. So I'm, and I'm just to set the stage for people who are listening. So my undergraduates have only lived in a world of standards and standardised tests. And so their impression of the world of education is that standards drive everything. Standards have always driven everything. And assessment really is just about taking tests. OK, and then I have another group of students who are people who are teachers who are in graduate classes, usually in leadership or people that are going to graduate classes to get their teaching license. Um, and their impression is we've always had standards. <laughs> standards are what drives everything. And the only way to assess is through tests because tests and assessment are the same thing. OK, mm -hmm. and so there's there's a couple of things I want to kind of unpack with you, if you don't mind. Um, okay. First thing is standards, okay? From my understanding of the United States, we've only had standards since maybe the 1990s. Um, 80s. It, it started rolling. The, the ball started rolling in the 80s and really took off in the 90s. Okay. So my question for you is, why did we need to put standards in place? I believe it was because of uh, a nation at risk. Mm. So... Your students can look that up. It was a report, I think, done for the Reagan administration, kind of saying, well, we better look out or we're going to fall behind mm -hmm. the rest of the world, kind of like we have recently. <laughs> so it, it, it was funny how this goes in cycles. I know. It, 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 it was meant to put the fear of God in yeah. everybody, the public, politicians, Educator, so it's like okay, well, we've got to um, figure out what it is that's important to teach and, and come up with these standards. Now, you know, and that's really not a bad idea. And a lot of like a lot of things in education, the concept is really good, but then something happens and it just becomes awful. And mm -hmm. what um, is interesting is is with a lot of these standards, we're there were good assessments. They were mm -hmm. using performance tests. It wasn't all multiple choice. You know, that's not how it was. That's not how it started out. Um, very few, as a matter of fact, just uh, a lot of states, several states were coming up with these performance assessment programs and giving these tests that were more than just rote memorization, mm -hmm. you know, multiple choice, the kind of standardized tests that, you know, most people took, have taken, are still taken. And it was great. Now, the problem with, with it was that eventually we got to no child, child left behind right after the turn of the 21st century. And it called for more accountability. I mean, the standards, Standards basically is is about accountability. We want to we want to teach this. We want to make sure it's taught, and we're going to come up with assessments to measure that. But when No Child Left Behind rolled around, they increased the number of tests, and I'm calling them tests because the these really good uh, uh, statewide assessment programs had kind of fallen by the wayside because people were cutting their education budgets mm -hmm. 
something about performance tasks and performance assessment. I, I digress here, but uh, I'm going to come back to this one because I, I like this. I, I saw this years ago. Somebody called uh, the, the usual suspects of performance tasks are uh, cost and subjectivity. Mm. And that's kind of what killed off these really good performance assessment programs, statewide performance assessment programs that were measuring the standards. It was very costly to put these type of tests in compared to multiple choice because multiple choice, you just bubble in, run it, run it through a machine. There you go. Uh, and then the time, time is money. So that's the cost subjectivity because you're having to score these with a rubric there's always going to be subjectivity at any time, you know, anytime you score something with the rubric, I don't care what it is. You could have the best rubric in the world, the most well-trained teachers using that rubric and you're still going to have subjectivity. Absolutely. I think for someone that also speaks to, um, especially if you go into the nineties of the, the discussions and the talking points about how schools are filled with bad teachers. Mm -hmm. So if you're having bad teachers, then they're going to be, they don't have the ability to be professional and look at a rubric and grade something with their professionalism. They're going to grade through their subjectivity lens because they're not good at what they do. And so right. we've got to take these teachers out of the equation. At least that's my, my perception of how this kind of ties in as well. Um, and, and then can I up can step a, you know, a private company, like yeah, this. well, that that's the other um, thing is, is fill the gap. You know? want, <laughs> the, the other thing with no child left behind is okay. So everybody said, well, if we're going to have to test all of these grade levels and do it every year, then we got to come up with something cheap, quick, and dirty. And mm -hmm. that was the multiple choice standardized test. So then there was the shame factor of mm -hmm. schools being called out uh, and and getting in the media and, and everybody got their grade on the report card and, you know, shame will, is, is, a, is a motivator, but it motivates people to not necessarily do the right thing. So this move, standards movement that ended up, you know, that started out uh, being a good thing ended up being a really bad thing because it was, okay, well, the way we have to show that we've met these standards is to teach our kids how to do well in these multiple choice tests, which basically came down to teaching the test. Now, mm -hmm. really, on a, there, there's a continuum of uh, ethics <laughs> on training, teaching kids to do well on the test. Mm -hmm. And on the ext one, one extreme end is what happened to in, in the city of Atlanta uh, the cheating scandal that was in the media, but then, you know, then it was out of the, the, you know, once it was no longer in the news, you never hear about it, but they were actually teaching test items. They knew yeah. what was on the test. They had mimeographed the tests, giving out copies to teachers and saying, teach these items. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the really far bad extreme of the continuum. And the other end of the continuum is you just teach what you're supposed to teach and things will fall in line. Yeah. Not many people are doing that because if everybody wants to um, do well on the test, there's going to be some kind of teaching to the test. Not necessarily the items, but we're going to, we know what needs, the kids need to get right. And it kind of dumbed down teaching to this. Uh, I think the, some of the terms were. Uh, kill and drill and, mm -hmm. and, and the road instruction of, of memorization but uh, it was it was not a good situation I will I will digress again because <laughs> I digress a lot um, tell me when you've had too much digression is when I was teaching my last teaching job I was teaching at a magnet school for high achievers and these were some of the smartest kids in DeKalb County mm -hmm. and towards the end of my teaching career, this was after No Child Left Behind came out, we got a visit from some people at the central office and they were looking at our test scores and they were saying, well, you know, you still need to teach to the test. And we were like, and the thing was, is we had the kids, the reason those kids got into the school was because of their standardized test scores. That's right. So we knew we didn't have to teach to the test. So we taught what we thought was important and covered the standards in the same way, but it was it was an ideal situation because nobody was questioning our test scores because we had the best test takers in the county. But yeah. 
I, I would have hated to have been at another school and had those people come out from the central office and saying, this is what you have to do. This is what you have to teach. I had the same similar experience. My first teaching job in the States, I just came out of the UK and they, they had a curriculum revamp and we were doing a lot of performance-based assessment and uh, project-based assessment in, in the schools where I, work, where I was working. And I, and I came out here to the States and had a job in a, a, a low SES school district with very poor and low test scores. And, you know, I had a, a, an administrator with, you know, I think he, I think he, he taught music for three years before he became an admin and uh, was, was pretty much telling me if I don't lecture so that they hear everything come out of my mouth and teach and test according to this multiple cho choice test format, then I'm not teaching. <laughs> and yeah. and um, it was an interesting conversation for me because I'd been trained in an environment where if you did a multiple choice test for any, at any time, you got laughed at. And you know, the kids used yeah. to laugh at you for doing it because they called it multiple guess. They knew it was a, 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 a silly way of assessing. Did you say multiple guess? Getting it right. So they called yeah. it multiple guess. Yeah, that's, <laughs> what, that's what we called it, multiple yeah. guess. That's, that's... And, and, and so it just blew my mind that this was going on. Uh, and we had teachers who were considered amazing at what they did because they had fantastic management of, of the students. But nothing substantive happened in their classrooms, and, and they, they and the kids did they did okay, but they could have done better if they were allowed to actually learn stuff properly. Um, and it's just the nature of the, it became the nature of what became normal, I think, in the two thousands. And it's it was it's a shame yeah. because a lot of our so we've got a whole generation of new teachers coming through who that's what they know. Yeah, and the kids. Um, meanwhile, the kids that have graduated are. The kids that came up were, you know, as long as they passed the multiple choice test, everything was fine and dandy. So we weren't really measuring the things that we should have measured. Um, your, your situation was similar to my wife's in that she taught elementary school. That's where we met at an elementary school. Um, and after my son was born, we saw how much good, good daycare cost and we saw how much both of us were making and I was in a doctoral program and I had a raise eventually coming along. So she stayed home with our son and then our daughter. And then when we moved to Virginia Beach, she took a job teaching. And in that uh, eight to 10 years that she was out of the classroom, things had changed. There were prescribed lessons and you know she had they were people just like you had saying if you're not doing it this way you're not teaching and she remembered in the good old 90s when uh if you were a creative teacher and you you know you you taught to the standards but you were able to come up with your own lesson plans mm -hmm. and your, your own god forbid tests and you know multiple choice tests do have a purpose it's just not the best way to uh judge kids teachers, schools, it really, you know, when you see uh, school systems with really good test scores and classes and teachers, it means that they've either got some good students, as in these kids have all the advantages already, and those are the kids that do well. I mean, there's definitely a correlation between socioeconomic status and, and test scores. Or if it's a school that's an anomaly, maybe a low SES school that has high test scores, maybe they're just teaching that test to the kids, you know, mm -hmm. and, they, and, they, and it's just kill and drill. And that's not going to serve those kids because, right. you know, life is not multiple choice. You get out of school, you get a job, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to choose A, B, C, or D. You got to come up with solutions to problems yourself. So this, this feeds into my other sort of question then. With, ass, with, you know, with assessments, mm -hmm. there's this misconception that you know, all assessments should be tests. Yeah. Um, and when, when we ask students to write a unit plan or a lesson plan or you know, even graduate level stuff, they're still talking about they're going to test the knowledge at the end, <laughs> which is this, this very low level mindset. Yeah. So, so can you can you sort of tell us more about sort of what assessments should well, be doing? Test is more of a, it's it's a formal thing, and people think that 
test and assessment are the exact same thing. They're not. Assessment is ongoing. I, I was constantly assessing kids when I was in the classroom. You know, I was assessing how engaged they were. Mm. Seriously, because uh, that would tell me. It also was kind of an evaluation of my own teaching. If I was assessing the class and they were completely bored, I'm going, I got, you know, I got to change this. You know, I, I uh, the other thing is, is you can have formal assessments and some of those are tests. Assessment is just a really broad term. And I'm sure people are familiar with the terms formative assessment and summative assessment. And I will, depending on who you read or who you believe, you're going to see, I, I, I've seen websites say, well, there's three kinds of tests. There's formative, summative, and benchmark. Oh, I've seen that too, yeah. And and then, uh, then there's, what was it when we had in Virginia Beach, we had diagnostic and mm-hmm. mid-year and post years I, I don't know I the thing the thing about the, the easy way to think about formative and summative is is that formative and summative aren't type are not types of tests absolutely not and you can take any test or assessment and use it formatively or use it summatively mm-hmm. and if you're using test results summatively for example um, sometimes you have to use your subjectivity back in the days when I was teaching on on report cards on how well a student um, listens and and follows directions. Okay. So I would think about all of the, the, the things that I'd observed about a kid and then I would give them a summative grade, you know, of, you know, met this, met their standard or whatever yeah. or needs improvement. So I was kind of using those assessments of individual kids summatively because I was putting down a grade. Okay. Yeah. And is that really the difference maker? Once you kind of have it recorded and reported on that formative check becomes a summative grade. Yeah. And, and you can, but you can still use, any assessment, and I'm not going to just I'm not going to use teacher observation anymore because no. that, that's just that's kind of vague. But uh, let's say just having kids little short answer quiz, all mm-hmm. right? Now I could grade it and put it in my grade book because if you don't have enough grades in your grade book, you know your principals or your assistant principal, somebody is going to come to you and say, hey, I don't have any grades. We're six weeks into the semester. Um, And you can use that summatively. And you can also use it formatively. Mm -hmm. You can look and see what the kids wrote, and that's going to inform instruction for them. Now, if you have a lot of kids in your class that are making the same mistakes on your little assessment, then you know what you need to teach the class or what you maybe and probably failed to teach well, but you can use an assessment both formatively and summatively, but it drives me nuts when um, people say, well, these are our formative assessments. Well, no, they're your assessments, but they're not formative. If the teachers aren't using them formatively, that is to inform instruction, share results with kids, don't necessarily show them a grade because that makes it summative. You know, there's some interesting studies where they uh, showed kids papers that teachers would put grades at the top of, you know, and mm-hmm. you know, this is kind of a no brainer. A lot of research is no brainer. It just reiterates, it, you know, it proves what we already knew where if there's a kid writes a term paper and the teacher writes a grade at the top, A, B, C, D, whatever, the kid's going to look at the grade and then just set it aside. But if there's no grade at the top, yet the kid can see that there's comments, that's formative assessment. Mm -hmm. You know, you you, you tell the student what they're doing right, what they need to improve on, and then you're using that formatively. But by putting a grade on it and assuming that that grade's going to go in the grade book, that's that's making it a summative. You're using it summatively. So Absolutely. I hope. That- I'm sure I remember reading 
uh, probably Dylan, Dylan William, because he writes about all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and he used to do the meta analyses of all of these practices and what, what kind of has an effect on what doesn't have an effect. Yeah. And in all the things he writes about, there's kind of one thing he says that makes any difference. And that's the quality of formative feedback. Oh. You know, and if you're not giving good, timely, meaningful feedback, then you're just not doing your work. Yeah. Well, and, and so, you know, we, we worry so much about the final grade and the summative score, but the really important thing is what feedback is that student getting so they can then improve on what they do. Yeah, and, and what I said recently really kind of comes straight from Dylan William. That's right. The, uh, the, the black box articles. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it just, you know, that is the seminal research. That's yeah. really, to me, kind of what got the whole idea of formative correct. But then again, the formative assessment and summative assessment, they kind of became buzzwords and people dumbed it down. But what he really is talking about is doing what teachers should be doing, which is looking at work and helping students determine where they need to go from here. Mm -hmm. And the problem with summative assessment is that they get a grade and it's not a very good grade. It's, it, it's, and, and the same thing with the, the, the standardized tests, so the state mandated standardized tests, all they do is create winners and losers. Mm -hmm. Um, one of my children, my, my oldest, my son, um, he was never good at testing, extreme test anxiety, although as a male, he would never admit it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and I did a lot of work with test anxiety. That was my dissertation topic. But uh, he, the SOLs, which are the standards of learning in Virginia, I don't know if your, your listeners know what that is, SOL, it's well, there's, there's, I can't remember what they're called here. There, there's some, the state tests in this area have a different name, but they're same right well, here. When I told my friends in Georgia that the uh, state tests in Virginia were called SOL, <laughs> it means something different in Georgia. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but you can, you can ad lib on that one later if you want to. <laughs> but um, the problem with the SOLs for my son was he wasn't passing them. Yeah. And the more he didn't do well on them, the more discouraged he got, but the kind of instruction he was getting to try to fix the situation was not the right type of instruction. It was rote, it was here, memorize this, do this, do this practice test, do this other practice test, and then you'll do great on the test when really the problem was his test anxiety, Mm -hmm. and the fact that it's self-affirming he you know when you have extreme test anxiety things go through your head during a test that i'm not going to do well on this test my mm -hmm. parents are going to be disappointed my teacher's going to be mad and then you can't concentrate on the test and then when you flunk it it just affirms everything that you were well, thinking well, sorry, and you do even cool. worse on the net you do worse on the next test yeah. You know? And, and then, you know, look at the lock-on effects of this too. And, you know, we see this across the nation. How many middle school classrooms and upper elementary school classrooms where we see students having to do, because English and math are the things that tested the most. Mm -hmm. yes. So English and math are where students fail the most. And so we see students being put into extra math and extra English classes being still being taught in the same way. And then they're missing out on, you know, stuff that can really help their brain development, like music or and, art. Or, and the fun stuff that people yeah, want, that kids yeah. love school for. Yeah. I mean, you know, when, yeah, when I never, I never, yeah. I never taught a first or second grader that didn't love school. Yeah. But I know that by middle school, a lot of kids hate school for the same, re for the reason that you're explaining. And, and you know, the funny thing is for all this extra time in English and math, schools haven't gone up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, there's, again, it feeds into this, the, these, these practices that we do that aren't always best for people, um, which is fascinating. <laughs> Why do we keep doing that? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, yeah. yeah. As long as we're dropping names, uh, Dylan William, mm -hmm. you saw him when he came to Virginia Beach, right? No, I didn't. You no, didn't? Just... You weren't working at the central office then? Well, no, I, I did. No. I was no, I privileged. Didn't. I went up and... and, and and, and he probably gets this all the time, but I went up to him after he gave his little talk. I was like, you know, 
that article that you wrote, what was with the other guy, the initial art, the original article? Oh, uh, Black, Black and Williams. Yeah, Black and Williams. And, and I said, you, that article you wrote with your, your colleague, I said, that kind of really changed how uh, I looked at assessment. Mm -hmm. You know, and I didn't have anything for him to autograph. So he just said, okay, thank you. And then I walked away. <laughs> um, but that, that Jim, was, Jim another, here's another one. Here's another name is Jim Popham, James Popham. Oh, Popham. Yes, yes. And uh, I, I, I was looking up to see if he was still alive. He, he turned 90 back in July. Wow. And he was at a conference I was at a year ago. He's still going. I mean, he's still wow. giving presentations. You know, we should all be so lucky to be, you know, mentally sharp and able to get around wow. when so. we're in our 80s. I mean, I'll, I'll take it through my late 70s if I could. Yeah. So he, a lot of my ideas come from Popham, and he's written some excellent books, mm -hmm. including some on assessment literacy. So if uh, any of the listeners out there are interested in assessment literacy, just just Google J his name is W. James Popham, P-O-P-H-A-M, or Jim Popham. And he writes for ASCD. He writes for everybody, actually. He's, 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 he's actually he's quite, a, quite a living good. legend. Yeah. He's not hard to read. Some folks are really hard to read. He, he's yeah. not. He, no, he, 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 he's, he's been kind of an influence on my style of writing because I try to throw in something that, you know, loosens it up a little bit because I know that assessment can be a really dry subject. So you better say something funny every once in a while. You're going to lose your audience. Absolutely. Uh, I really can't thank Doug enough for explaining what is essentially a complicated topic on which there is so much research about so concisely and succinctly. In the next episode, we will conclude our conversation about assessment by looking at innovative practices and what the future might hold for assessment after the pandemic is over. But until then, that was episode 16 of the Teachers Tea Time podcast. This podcast is a proud member of Adjacent, a design collaborative made up of educators who dream of a better world for our students and their teachers. We create, write, talk, teach, and learn about the things that matter most in education. To find out more, point your browser to www.adjacent.org. That's www.edjacent.org. For me, it's the stories of teachers, students, and school communities that matter. As such, this podcast is only possible with the help and support of its listeners. Please leave positive reviews wherever you are able. If you're an iTunes or a Spotify subscriber, Leaving a good review can really help our visibility. Also, please don't keep this podcast to yourself. Tell your friends to subscribe and listen too. One thing we all have in common is that we've been to school. So, if you'd like to contribute to the pod in any way, if you have a story to share, long, short, tragic, or comic, if you have comments to make about the podcast, or just want to say hi, you can send an email to Teachers Tea Time Pod at gmail.com. I love to read what you have to say. Or if social media is your thing, you can follow me on Twitter at Mark Diacop and on Instagram as Mark Diacopoulos. You can find suggestions for topics, copies of the show notes, and you can download previous episodes of the podcast at www.teacherstetimepod.com. The podcast artwork was created by Phaedra. Opening and closing music is by Brian Boyko. It's been my pleasure to be your host today. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.